welcome to the podcast series Talking Success, connecting the global fintech community. I'm Stacey Jafta, and today I'll be chatting with Cynthia Wandia, co founder and CEO of Quora. Quora is a Nairobi and Berlin based startup turning credit unions into modern digital banks. Their mission is to enable the world's 3 billion underserved to become financially healthy. Cynthia, hello, good morning. Good morning, Stacey. How are you? Good, good, good. How's your day going? So far, so good. Uh, bright and sunny. Um, yeah, it's a lovely day. Did you mention you're in Berlin? I am. We have a team in Berlin. Um, ah. Our HQ is in Nairobi, and so I'm spending a bit of time uh, with them. Is it more of a tech hub, commercial hub, or just a mix of people over there? It's largely a, a tech. So our tech team is is between Nairobi and, and Berlin. Um, so there's mostly tech in, in Berlin. Um, but we also have a couple of other roles here. Okay, cool. Well, before we go any deeper, Cynthia, I'd love to hear just more about your story and essentially what led you to build Quora. Yeah, so I have... Um, I probably started out with uh, a, a general love for problem solving. So I have an engineering background um, and I always enjoyed just sort of applying um, principles uh, or, or theories to a, an actual um, problem. Mm-hmm. Um, career wise, uh, so because in college I spent most of the, a fair bit of time in the lab, um, I took every chance I could in the summers and then after graduation to be involved in something that had uh, people and business. Uh, yeah. So I was looking to work in different corporates, uh, also looking to work in different parts of the world. Um, I took a, a tangent towards the energy sector, um, uh, moving to Germany um, to join a utility uh, first as a trader. And then I got to do really cool things, um, even <laughs> climbing wind turbines uh, as, as a Whoa. former engineer. That was that was quite cool. Um, yeah, but um, all of that was kind of um, preparation in terms of a certain type of professionalism, delivery, communication, mm-hmm. um, and stakeholder management that um, would become really useful later on um, when I when I started uh, my first company. Um, my first startup was actually invested in by um, the the company I was working for at the time, um, and it was an energy advisory business and. Um, yeah, that was my first uh, opportunity to like solve a problem, bring a mm. team together and try to like tackle it head on. Um, we did this for about three years um, with a uh, lot, lot of success, a lot of learnings. And um, towards the end, after three years, we wound it down um, because we wanted to do individually, uh, wanted to do um, a couple of different things. I wanted to really work on something that had the ability to scale much more than an advisory um, okay. business. And so, um, yeah, and, and I'd say that combination of um, different sectors, different um, roles from engineering to advisory to trading, um, and then the decision to work on rather something product led, um, those are what really led me to um yeah, to to getting started with with Quora. Where did your love for fintech come from? What was your background on that? You know, I feel like for fintech, this the fin part, um, everyone has to interact with with money and 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 with you know finance in some way. Um, I must say, like looking back, there there must have been an extremely formative um, impact on me growing up. Um, in Kenya, which is the land of M-Pesa, right? So as mm-hmm. soon as that came out pretty early on, this is like 2008. And I remember like that being a very interesting thing because it immediately replaced something that we knew everyone was doing. You, you need to send money to the village, to your grandma. Um, what do you do? You go to a, uh, the post office or you go to like the bus station terminal, you, you give a package and uh, when it gets to the village, um, someone picks it up and all of a sudden you didn't have to do that. Right. So I'd say those looking back, um, that must have had a, a formative um, impact and then kind of layering that on with um, experiences in you know, in energy and in other sectors where the importance of infrastructure would just like 
make all the difference, right? Yeah. Once you have the infrastructure, you can do so much more. I'd say that's that's probably what has led to this um, now a, a much more um, focused, um, yeah, the fact that I'm a bit more focused on, on fintech now. Perfect. Okay. So I'm really curious about the product side and I know you have a love product and you focus heavily on building a well-oiled product culture, Aquara. What does that look like? Yeah, it starts for me with, um, well, like I mentioned, I think having seen what, um, what, what, what happened when you don't have something that scales, like when you don't deliver value in a scalable way, like, by a consulting, for example, um, I was I was almost obsessed with trying to um, understand how to infuse as much value as possible in in a product, so that uh, whether it's one person or a hundred thousand people using it, like they could still enjoy the same value. Um, and that that was the, the kind of the foundation. Um, and the second layer on top of that was um, really seeing what it looked like when you solved um solve someone's problem or uh brought delight to their um to their normal work and this specifically when we started off um because we provide um first like a, a core banking solution for uh credit unions that that's like the the first product i remember how much time it, we spent um looking at their day to day and 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 how we could improve it um and when we finally gave um uh, launched the first product um, the number of times the uh, users, the staff would say how easy it is to use, how much they, I mean, they were spending eight hours a day on our, our product, right? So um, I think this is what, uh, this is the foundation of our product culture is um, your users need to be successful in their, um, in what they're trying to do. They need to feel very, very delighted. They need to enjoy um what what they're doing um and that works if you're making things much much easier for them um and so attracting people with a similar mindset who are happy to spend all day sitting with the different users and watching how things are going and um improving it we are happy to redesign things three four times even if you know until we get it right yeah um that's the sort of product culture we've built up and what's the dynamic between the teams or specifically the sub product teams? Yeah, so we started off um as one one team um all together as it grew and as we started um we started off because by by serving the credit union as as the first customer so there were different users there maybe the the front office um customer relations teams or the uh, finance teams, uh, the board. Um, so we were one team, one product team that was um, understanding all these different personas and, and making sure we can serve their needs. Um, but eventually we launched another product that was targeting the members of the um, credit union. So the actual account holders. Um, and uh, and in that sense, we, we already identified we needed to kind of split the team. So we went into a bit of a squad structure each uh, squad orientated around a different, uh, let's say, customer or, or mm -hmm. user. Um, and the same with our, our API team. Um, and as that's evolving, we can see um, that that's worked really well because it allowed each product team to kind of build a really deep understanding of each of these uh, very different um, uh, customers or users. Um, as we, I can already see an evolution where we'll move more to um, less of the the product facing and more of the um kind of end to end job to be done yeah. right like saving or lending or, or or balances or transfers just because we could start to see the end to end um impact of that but i think that takes time and and we're not afraid to reorganize the um company uh we do it at least probably about once a year you guys were growing really, really quickly. And I know that you guys needed to accelerate the growth of the product team specifically. How did you do this? There's a huge credit um, to the uh, early team members in our product team who also sort of doubled down as doubled up as growth uh, uh, team members. Okay. So they put our name out there in various design um, communities, various product communities. Um, we would be listed on, you know, kind of best designed websites, uh, submit ourselves for like um, product UX awards. And that did bring a, a spotlight of, 
you know, on, on us. Uh, and so we started to attract just really great, great um, candidates for, for the, the teams. Um, and I would say I would never underestimate that. Um, I've seen that also work very well with, with engineering um, tech with different companies, like just yeah. having your presence in different communities does attract really high quality candidates. Um, and the second is just really prioritizing the user experience and the design and the um, design language that you use. Um, we've gotten, we've attracted a lot of people who are just, they've never seen enterprise software that looks like Quara. If they look at it, that you open it, it's pink. There's all these different um, yeah. uh, stylistic elements and it would tend to attract people who are um, curious about uh, making something as, um, you know, fu fundamental as core banking um, as as beautiful as possible. When you say you were involved in different communities, what do you mean by that? And what communities specifically? Yeah, so it would be like, um, you know, there'd be like UX design, like global UX designer um, Slack communities. There's like a, there's a ton of product, um, especially I find with product, um, there's a lot of community driven um, learning, right? So you, if you are keen on learning how to be a UX designer or keen on getting into product management, um, there's so many um, online communities where people are, it's like stack overflow, but yeah, like for, yeah. for product, right? And so um, our early, like early team members were already engaged. And so that kind of brought us into, into some of these different um, uh, communities and got you that, yeah, exactly. That's that's how we were able to um, to get our name out there. Yeah, I know many fintechs don't focus on process in their early stages. You guys were growing really, really quickly and specifically looking at how to be compliant with process and people. It was important to you to put together proper contracts and onboarding processes. What mm -hmm. advice do you have for early stage startups in regards to this? I would say first and foremost, uh, protect protect your people um with with everything you have like um i know in the list of priorities sometimes it feels like um that one's trivial it's admin you can um you'll come back to it you'll you'll fix it uh once once everything is is working um what i did i was fortunate to be able to get advice from experienced um uh, HR personnel. Um, yeah. I happen I happen to be the daughter of of a experienced HR manager. Oh wow! Helpful. But, yeah, yeah. But what it what I would advise is spend the time. It's maybe the first uh, part of the first month. Um, get advice. There's like you can get very affordable. Um, if you get a good accounting uh, company, usually they'll also know a good HR company. Just a consultant who can help you set up your contracts. Um, talk you through the process of hiring, um, uh, offboarding if you have to, what to do when there's some non-compliance or, or breach, um, how you can reward people and so on. It's like a crash course in HR, but you as a founder do need to know um, what to do because it's a very expensive mistake to yes, make, not only yes. cost-wise, but if you lose your reputation for um, uh, not having this kind of compliance, you, you also lose a lot of trust. What mistakes do you see many startups make in, in when it comes to people, process, onboarding, offboarding? The first I would definitely say is like not um, not aligning with whatever legal framework is there. Um, mm. The labor laws exist for a reason, and that's to protect um, both the uh, people, both the employees and the company. So mm. get familiar with them. It's important. I mean, if you're starting a business, it's part of the responsibilities you have. So it might sound like adult, uh, grown up, uh, hard <laughs> things, but like, just get, get your head around that the same way you would have to get your head around, uh, taxes and, uh, yeah. um, like your financial setup. That's, that's the first. Um, and then, and then, um, try to build in the process for it. So at, at the beginning, we just put a block of time and we just said like, we're going to spend this amount of time every week on these topics so that we never deprioritize them or we never um, get, you know, pick the, the highest burning thing or the most uh, exciting growth focused um, mm -hmm. thing. We always put time in the calendar to review our contracts, who's, you know, re review performance, um, 
uh, understand if anything has changed in the in the in the country you're you're working because that does happen. Regulations change, uh, new requirements for maybe workplace insurance come in. You don't want to be caught uh, sleeping on those. Um, yeah, and I think that's just the best way. Instead of nobody expects you to uh, to know everything at once, and you may not afford all the resources at the beginning to have like um, experienced uh, people working yeah. in there. But if you block the time um, and, and just dedicate some focus on it, you you can get quite far. Scott, could you design a video game? I could make you a hypothetical one. If I took some random genres, mechanics, maybe blended them together and uh, created a new hypothetical game. And that would make a great podcast. Undoubtedly. So what would you make? Something original and exciting? A Dark Souls city builder, a co-op roguelike, everything, all of that. You know, we could use the Nemesis system from a and put it in a first-person shooter, and we could have a loot system with survival mechanics and, and motion controls. And maybe you could, oh, I don't know, save a kingdom from some out-of-control toasters. You know, uh, what about party? Catch the Gaming Blender on all your favorite podcast platforms. Mixing people and culture and building this culture of Quora, were you a massive driver of this? Did you seek advice on how to build a people culture or did you just feel it out as the business grew? Um, both. Um, so I've heard this over and over again that, um, you know, the, the, the founder, the co-founding team uh, sets sets the culture and, and I do believe it. Um, I believe in um, First, getting attracting the the brightest and smartest people you can you can get, um, and then setting them up for success. So whatever you need to be successful, and then um, kind of letting them letting them shine. Um, and so that's what we've. I, I I do see that infused in in the culture. Um, we're also very like uh, uh, transparent, so trying to communicate, uh, to think think out loud. We sort of think in public. That's it. Um, <laughs> I love that. So, so you just think like everyone. It does feel sometimes a bit stream of conscious, but what it does is it allows you to kind of get into people's heads and see how they're looking at something and contribute where you need to, but also not. Um, and I'd say that yeah, the, that's a culture that both myself and my co-founder um, have. Um, and then we just just love what we're doing, and so uh, we're having a great time. We love to like every time I go to the office, it's like I'm so happy to get there. Um, I don't want to leave. Um, I'll go in on the weekends. We'll have our happy hours. We'll have um, birthdays awesome. together. So if you're having a good time, um, even when it's hard, um, I think you also get to attract people who enjoy having fun while they do hard things. Yeah. You were heading Quora alone for the first year and a half as the sole founder and then mm-hmm. onboarded David as the co-founder and mm-hmm. COO. How did you make the decision to bring him on as a co-founder rather than just a COO? Yeah. the First off, uh, speaking of advice to founders, definitely, um, definitely get a co-founder if you can. Um, but, uh, no co-founder is better than a bad co-founder, of course. Yeah. Um, but yeah. a great co-founder is like, you just, it, it multiplies you, uh, and, and your, your, what you can do, um, beyond your wildest dreams, mm-hmm. at least for me. Um, and the reason I, we, I went with, um, you know, David coming on as a co-founder is because he acted like a co-founder. Um, he not only, um, immediately, uh, love you know dug into the business built his mm-hmm. own com- conviction around it got familiar with with it and the opportunity as well as the approach we were taking to solve it and then the second thing is he um i would say like just completely absorbed the team like started understanding each and every person's motivation um and grew to yeah just just grew to love them as as if he had brought them on himself and that happened in a very short time. So um, the third, we, we, we did actually work together um, for a couple of um, weeks before we made the, the call and the complementary skills just stood out, right? For yeah. Every, every area that I couldn't use support in was his, his shining strength and every area he can use support in is my shining strength. So that combination of things um, made it, 
like, yeah, it, it, it was extremely fortunate because it is very, very difficult uh, to find a co-founder um, and more so after you've launched. Uh, but yeah. if you're a solo founder, um, I'd still keep open. It could have been two years, even if he had joined two or three years later. Um, make room. I think it's possible to still make room in your uh, business for this because it does multiply what you can do um, by a massive factor. What does being a co-founder mean to you and what difference of an impact did it make? So if you brought David on as just COO, he hypothetically is naturally this person that's going to absorb all the teams and he has a hunger to learn and a hunger to get involved. What difference of that title did it make? Is there a risk element that comes with being a co-founder? What does that mean to you? There's some aspects I would say you can highlight, but they would also act uh, they they would also apply to other team members, regardless of the co-founder role. So indeed, um, risk uh, the the willingness to take like um, financial risk, uh, so to invest. Um, that's that's one um, acting like an owner. But as I would say, with a lot of key team members, if not the entire company, um, at the beginning, uh, you you do tend to attract people who act like owners, and you you reward them as such. Um, but I would say there's there was a commitment to the long term journey. Um, looking at it like it's not a two year cycle in out uh, thing. Yeah. It is something that is a long term journey. I'm willing to commit my life uh, for as far as I can see it to solving yeah. this problem. Yeah, I think that makes makes a big difference. Um, yeah. Okay. I love it. You are actually one of the first guests I've had on the podcast that joined a venture builder before they had an idea. Can you walk me through this? It's a very unique model. It's, it's been successful, uh, produced a lot of great companies um, uh, across across the world. And it's basically, you'll have a, a venture studio, like a, a, a company that has that looks for opportunities, maybe researches them um, or identifies them through different means and then attracts entrepreneurs to come and join uh, the founding teams and and launch it. Um, I joined, there's some of the larger ones. I joined a rather boutique one in based out of uh, Berlin. And um, of all the opportunities that they were looking at, one of them really stood out to me. And I think that's very important is even if the initial seed for the idea was presented to me, um, there was already a spark there. So this was looking at the coffee supply chain uh, and, and why um, a farmer who will do all the work will actually get um, the least amount of value yeah. from yeah. this product. And I, it struck a chord with me because um, one, I love coffee. Um, but two, <laughs> uh, hey, um, my grandmother uh, was a small scale coffee farmer from Kenya and was exactly this type of person who does all the work and maybe ends up selling their coffee for about a dollar uh, per, per kilo. And then Kenyan coffee will retail for 40 to $60 a kilo um, in Europe or in, in the US. And so that that was enough that interest um was enough for me to pick it up uh look into the opportunity it started off from a you know looking at a trade finance um solution but then we realized how much the farmers were reliant on their um credit union their savings and credit cooperative gotcha, and gotcha. how much of a first line of defense that was that um we then combined that insight with the inherent knowledge and expertise of a venture builder I joined, which was building um, fintech infrastructure to uh, come up with what is Quara today. Um, I'd say that it is still really important to connect with the idea, make it your own. um, And because it's something you're going to dedicate like a long time to it, especially if you're launching out of um, Africa, uh, even other emerging markets, they're, there's a long road ahead. Um, yeah. You've got to be really deeply connected um, with it, but but it is very possible. And I would encourage anyone who doesn't have an idea, but is excited about um, solving a problem, you know, find other co-founders um, you know, in these kind of like uh, meetup spaces, but also look into venture builders uh, where they kind of seed, they try to seed um, different opportunities uh, to, to smart people. And you you might end up designing something that that uh, you're willing to then solve for for a fair amount of time after. 
So how does it work? Do you fill out an application or are you more scouted? Yeah, the, the, they work pretty differently. Um, some of them you apply, some of them, um, I, I would say for the most part, you apply, you present yourself like, hey, I'm, I'm keen to solve a problem. Uh, what do you have that maybe suits my specific background? Um, there's, um, I'm, I'm seeing more and more of these coming up uh, also in Africa. Um, the, um, yeah, it's, it, I've seen, I'm seeing them come up as a way also to stimulate problem solving in certain sectors, right? Like mm. I've seen now for the blue economy or for climate uh, resilience, they're starting to set up uh, venture builders to attract potential entrepreneurs to come in, pick a chunk of something, pick an opportunity, um, and just get get obsessive about solving the problem, which is what in the end entrepreneurship is. It's just like an obsession to make something yeah. right that isn't. Um, and I think you can get you can build an obsession about about um, about something even even if you didn't know it before, right? You can yeah. just as soon as you uncover it, you can you can get obsessed about it. Was there pressure to build something for the sake of building? I would. No, no, I would. Okay. There wasn't, at least in in our in venture builder, not because there's no there's no incentive for anyone uh, for that to happen. Okay. Um, okay, let me put it like this: on some venture builders prefer to cycle through a lot of ideas very quickly, mm-hmm. right? Um, and it's a lot of like it's maybe the first four months to a year are more like um, a very quick market market test um and in that sense that in that sense you are maybe just building it to see if it you know throwing it out there seeing if it sticks um ours was a bit more boutique very focused and very committed to it had to have an impact on people planet and profit and um in that sense you that you you started off with a bit more capital but also um yeah a lot more commitment into and, and conviction in what you wanted to build. So there's probably something for, for everyone. If you want to rapidly test um, 10 different ideas and you're okay with that, then indeed you can build for the sake of, of building. But for the most part, they tend to prefer getting you um, matched with something that you're deeply yeah. convicted about. Fantastic. Cynthia, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was a delight having you on. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Stacey, for, for having me. Of course. Where's the best place for listeners to reach you? Yeah, the best place is on LinkedIn. Um, find Quara, follow us. Um, we are um, yeah, always super excited to partner, to um, speak with uh, smart people who are excited about improving financial health for everyone. We believe that the fastest way to deliver financial health is um, to as many people as possible in emerging markets is through these existing credit unions. So if that's exciting for you, reach out uh, to me on LinkedIn or email me, Cynthia at Quara.com. Fantastic. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Talking Success, Connecting the Global Fintech Community. Feel free to follow us on LinkedIn at Talent in the Cloud. And if you're interested in exec talent, expanding your team, or you yourself are looking for a new, exciting change in your career, check out our website, talentinthecloud.io.